So we are here together to envision the future that is now possible and plan for making that vision a reality. Why are we here? We're here because patients are waiting. And to borrow a term from Faster Cures, time equals lives. Patients do not have the next 15 years to wait. And I believe that they shouldn't need to. If we band together as a community to make the future we know is possible a reality. So I wanna finish with a picture uh, that Julia Vitarello will recognize. Uh, this is Julia's uh, daughter, uh, Mila, who passed away a few, a few uh, well, earlier this year. Uh, and, and, and Julia is going to give you a vision from a very personal point of view of the kind of future that, that I have in mind. And, and, and I think all of us, I hope all of us on this call have in mind. So I look forward to a great meeting. Thank you. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, so my name is PJ Brooks. I'm a program director of the Office of Rare Diseases Research here at NCATS, and I have the honor of introducing the next talk and, and moderating some of the sessions today. Um, when we were thinking about planning this meeting at, at the NIH, we felt we really had to have patients involved, and we decided to have one patient story uh, each day. And the patient story today will be presented by Julia Vitarello, who's the CEO of the Mila's Miracle Foundation and the mother of Mila, who you see here along with Julia. And she will tell you uh, the story of a little girl who had a disease, CLN7 Batten disease that was incurable. And since there's no effective treatment, the disease was not screened for um, and not detected early. But in fact, one of the disease causing mutations Mila had was indeed amenable to a gene target therapy. And the implications of that story for this meeting, I think will become obvious. So let me Joe, hand it over to Julia to tell you that story. Julia? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, PJ and the NIH for inviting me to tell Mila's story um, in the context of something that means a lot to me. So early diagnosis um, is incredibly important. And I, I know many of you know Mila's story, but I think that since there are so many of you watching right now, I'll just uh, give you a little bit of idea of, of what got me here and why um, I'm part of rare disease um, and why I'm speaking today. Um, my daughter Mila uh, was a very typical little kid in Colorado where we live. She was hiking and she was skiing. She was mountain biking, you know, by the time she was two, three years old. Uh, she had no red flags at any of her pediatrician appointments. Um, she was very outgoing, very verbal, um, no signs of anything wrong. Um, and then around three and a half, four years old, she started tripping. She was covered in bruises. Uh, she started stuttering in a very strange way. And I ended up bringing her to about 100 different doctors and therapist appointments over the next two, two and a half years. And at six years old, um, I gave up. I had gone to every specialist you could imagine and no one had any idea what was going on. I was told I was crazy too many times. Um, and I finally brought her into the ER of our local hospital, Children's Hospital Colorado. And Mila underwent a week of really horrible um, testing only to find out that she was diagnosed with a rare form of an already rare genetic disease called Batten disease. And her form was CLN7 of which there were 25 known cases in the world. And you know, at that time, um, there was really not much going on at the end of 2016. Gene therapy was uh, in the pipeline for a number of similar diseases. So I kind of, I started down that path and started Mila's Miracle Foundation. I didn't know anything about this. I just learned and read everything that I could. Um, and I started going down the gene therapy, gene replacement therapy path. But in order to do that, I needed to be totally sure that Mila had batten CLN7. And she had had a very strange uh, diagnosis where uh, the disease is autosomal recessive, meaning she needed a mutation from her mom and her dad. They could only uh, find one and no lab could find the other. So it took me down a rabbit hole where I started looking at uh, uh, spreadsheets online of children with batten CLN7. And I noticed, thank goodness, that uh, a scientist I recently met just a few months ago added a third column um, besides the two mutations for CLN7, added, added another column of 
um, other Batten mutations. Um, and I noticed that a number of children with Batten CLN7 also had a mutation in CLN5. So I, as a mother, not knowing much about genetics, questioned, does Mila have another form of Batten disease and perhaps only has one mutation in CLN7? And that really, um, I, I, I mentioned that detail because it's important because it is the only reason why I ended up uh, trying to really find her second mutation uh, when at the time I was being told that you know no lab would have the time to go down a rabbit hole and try to find this missing mutation. And if they did, they very likely wouldn't be able to uh, prove that it was in fact disease causing. Um, I decided to go down that path. I realized that whole genome sequencing was the way to go. There were only a few labs that offered it. And I reached out via social media with uh, an urgent plea if someone could help me get in um, to get Mila's whole genome sequencing done very rapidly instead of waiting for five months. And that landed my request on uh, Dr. Timothy Yu's desk at Boston Children's Hospital. And within you know, 24 hours, you know, the, it's amazing with social media what you can do. You know, he, through four or five different people, heard the story and said, I, I want to help. And he stepped up to help. And over the next few months, he ended up um, miraculously with his team finding Mila's very unusual missing mutation. He told me the incredible news um, that my little son, who I feared every day for three or four months, also was going to deteriorate and die, potentially. Um, I found out that he did not carry either mutation, and then he was free of Batten disease. And then Dr. Yu took it a step further, which he didn't need to do, but he did. And he had Spinraza on his mind, this drug that had just been approved three weeks before I met him and about one week after Mila uh, was diagnosed. And Spinraza was a game changer in neurology. You know, it was a drug, an ASO drug uh, for a somewhat similar, you know, neurodegenerative disease in children um, called spinal muscular atrophy. And many of these children um, that should have been, you know, in little wheelchairs and respirators and dead by the age of two were now running around and playing at six and seven years old. Um, Spinraza was on his mind and he and his team thought outside the box, you know, and this is really important here is that our story took a turn because they thought, what if we made a Spinraza like drug for Mila? And, you know, the answer from a lot of people was that's crazy. That's a crazy notion. You know, why, why, why would you do that? But going back to Chris Austin's, you know, really important topic is like, we need to think um, outside the box here because what we're doing right now is, is we are making progress, you know, but going gene by gene, is just, it's not gonna cut it. You know, there's just too much death and, and pain and suffering and sadness around rare disease, especially in children. And he thought outside the box, he continued down that road. And, and eventually I don't have time in this, in this uh, talk to go into detail, I wish I did, but um, over the course of that year, Dr. Yu and his team designed an ASO that was similar to Spinraza for Mila, very specific to her mutation. Um, and they tested it and eventually got approval from the FDA or a green light to move forward. And in January of 2018, we moved from Colorado to Boston and didn't really you know, know what was going on, except for that I had one moment to think, oh my gosh, this race of trying to you know, raise millions of dollars and not sleeping and putting scientists together and, and, and telling Mila's story all culminated in Mila was going to be receiving this drug called Milicin that was named after her because she was the only person in the world that had this mutation that they could find. Mila re began receiving this. And once again, you know, unfortunately I don't have a lot of time, but I think the important thing to know is that in the first year, uh, Mila, not only was her disease stabilized, which was barreling downhill leading up to Mielsen, um, she had lost her last words, she had lost her vision, she was losing her ability to swallow and to walk um, and having pretty out of control seizures up to 30 a day that were just terrible. And with Mielsen, her seizures basically got down to zero um, in that first year, she started sitting up more. Uh, her posture was, was much more straight. She could take more steps with my support from behind. Um, she had been receiving food and nutrition through G-tube. And after Mielison, she started eating by mouth again, um, pureed foods. And, you know, she was smiling and laughing more, which to me was the most important thing. And we saw incredible, you know, promise um, in the first year. However, you know, the way I describe it as I'm not, um, you know, a researcher scientist physician is that many dominoes had clearly fallen and, and we knew this was a possibility. Um, 
going into Milosin, but Mila was still laughing and smiling and she had something to preserve. Um, but perhaps too many um, dominoes had fallen um, by the time she began receiving Milosin. So in years two and three, it was somewhat stable and then eventually um, disease progressed um, in this last year. And I was faced with very, very, very painful and difficult decisions around me after fighting for her for three years. You know, I had to face, you know, her quality of life. And while her disease was greatly slowed, um, her hip came out of the socket. You know, that's part of something that happens with some neurodegenerative diseases and, you know, faced with um, really unbearable uh, decisions. And uh, as Chris Austin mentioned, Mila, um, her spirit left her body four months ago. So I am here today because I am not fighting for my daughter right now. What I am fighting for is that, you know, a lot of stars aligned for Mila. She had uh, everything worked for her. And I realized at a, a certain point that it could not all be for Mila. It had to be for something bigger. And that rare disease in children, and particularly in children for me, because I'm focused on this population, is it's drastic. It's unbelievably drastic. You know, it's, 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 we look at COVID, we look at the HIV and AIDS era, also drastic. We look at cancer. My mother has stage four non-small cell lung cancer. So unfortunately, I'm very familiar with that world. They're all drastic, but, you know, rare disease, rare, and I would like to stop calling it rare disease. And I agree with that term is this genetic disease, let's call it in, in, in children, I'm going to say for the sake of the argument, is unbelievably drastic. We're talking about, you know, an estimated 60 million children, you know, with fatal, life-threatening, debilitating, horrible diseases. And each one of them has siblings and parents and grandparents that are very directly related to them. I've lived this and it takes everyone down emotionally and physically. Um, and it's incredibly drastic and it requires thinking outside the box um, in order to come up with uh, an equally impactful solution and going gene by gene, like I said, I'm very grateful for, you know, I myself helped start through Milo's Milo Pro Foundation, a gene therapy for Batten CLN7 in parallel to this, working with, collaborating with another family, another foundation. That trial just started a few weeks ago. I'm very excited. You know, it wasn't in time for my daughter, but that's great. But we need to come up with platform solutions. And right now, ASOs, gene editing, you know, offer a platform solution, potential solution um, that's not disease specific. And it's, this is needed right now. And I really appreciate Chris Austin's, you know, words around this because we have got to be, I'm gonna use the word aggressive. I use it all the time. We have to be safe and we have to follow, you know, everything that's needed in order to make sure that these drugs are safe. However, we need to be aggressive and the entire field needs to feel a sense of responsibility. That's why I'm here today. I'm here because I feel an enormous responsibility to turn everything that Dr. Yu and his team and all of the stars that aligned, including having hundreds of amazing people, many of whom are probably watching right now, you know, really helped make Milosin happen. It was an enormous effort. Um, she happened to have an perfectly amenable mutation. She happened, her cells happened to respond really well to Milosin. Spinraza happened to have been approved just weeks before. Um, Mila's radiance is something that she's had since she was a baby, attracted um, the very much needed attention within science and outside of science and all the incredible donors that helped make Milosin happen. All of this was not for Mila. This is now for something bigger. And I believe that this individualized medicine approach, so looking at um, the actual mutation and not at the disease, um, is, is something that deserves really aggressive exploration. And what does that mean? That means that we need to treat more children and there needs to be um, a very clear regulatory path. And I appreciate that the FDA is, is issuing a draft guidance, which is going in that direction. So that's you know a big thank you to the FDA. And we need to keep moving in that same direction. Um, we need to have the PIs that are working on these um, ASOs and eventually gene editing um, individualized therapies that are targeting uh, mutations, they need to share data, especially tox data. The companies involved in this space that often hold on to this data, they need to understand that's their responsibility to share as much as possible to allow for this next phase where we treat as many kids as possible and learn. 
learn about the efficacy, learn about the toxicity, learn about the route of administration and the dose. I mean, we have to learn all this in order to really scale it and make it sustainable. And I think it's unethical to not, um, as a field, to not um, give this the best shot possible. When I say this, I mean these platform approaches that are targeting um, mutations. We have to think outside the box. We have to think differently. And so, you know, Dr. Yu and I climbed Mount Everest um, without oxygen, without maps, without any trail, without guides. That can be done again a few times, but it's not easy. And, and it should not have to be done like that. Everest needs to get smaller. There need to be maps. There need to be guides. There needs to be a very clear path. Um, and, you know, we need to think of innovative uh, commercial models because ultimately this can't stay only in academics because it needs to, in order to be really truly impactful across all of these tens of millions of just children with genetic disease. Um, you know, we need to be able to have a collaboration, a shared responsibility. We need to have a, uh, a, a, an innovative business model and we definitely need to have an insurance or payer model that's going to allow this to really be sustainable. So we need this process to get faster and cheaper and better quickly um, and, and safely. Um, and we need Everest to get down to the point where it's small enough, where you know, everyone you know, who's ASO amenable or you know, amenable to gene editing needs to be able to hike that and be able to uh, take that path. And, and those tens or hundreds of thousands or potentially more um, uh, of children that could receive a treatment like Melison, um, they deserve to have that. And we need to get to that point and we need to scale it um, uh, as, as aggressively and safely as possible. Um, and so I, you know, going to the theme of this, this meeting, you know, I think, of course, it's impossible for me to, to, to ask myself the question of if Mila were diagnosed and treated earlier, you know, what would, what would, what would life look like right now? Three months before Mila received Melison, she was not having any seizures. She was not, she did not have a G-tube. Uh, she was still saying a few words. So I wonder, you know, if Mila was diagnosed and treated earlier, she could still be alive. We could have stopped things, possibly we'll never know, in time before the disease progression really took over. Um, and I, and I, I think back on a question many people ask me as well, which is, would you have wanted to know that Mila had Batten disease when she was born? And I will tell you that 10 years ago, no, I wouldn't have because there was not enough going on then at the time. And then I would have had to live every day of my life knowing that she was gonna die. If you ask me that today, yes, absolutely. Why? Because there was something that could be done. And even though a, you know, a newborn screening panel might not include Batten seal on seven because there is no treatment, her actual mutation was treatable. So it requires now thinking of um, the treatment route very differently. And Mila's story shows that. So, you know, Mila's story has shown what is possible. Now we have an enormous responsibility as a field to turn what we know is possible for many, many, many other rare disease patients across hundreds of diseases, if not more. They deserve that chance too. So we have the responsibility of making that happen. So I'm really looking forward to um, the panel, the upcoming panel after this with Dr. Yu will be on it as well. And I'll be part of the Q&A of that um, and the rest of this conference. I think it's an incredibly important topic and I hope that Mila's story has helped um, give a concrete example um, of, of where we're headed and what's possible. Thank you.